Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, I am Dr. Shubha, Professor of Anatomy from Kempegoda Institute of Medical Sciences, Bangalore. Today I am going to talk about pharynx, the anatomy of pharynx. A child was born and the mother was happy with bringing up the child. By about 5 or 6 years of age, the child had repeated respiratory infections and it showed certain changes in the facial features. Mother was worried. She took the child to the doctor and the doctor told not to worry. He told there is a lymphoid organ which is present just behind the nose which is obstructing the pathway for the air. So the child is getting repeated respiratory infections and he is not able to breathe. All the facial changes what you see whether the protruding teeth or the high arched palate, all these are due to this particular lymphoid organ present behind the nasal cavity. So the mother was relieved and she asked the doctor to do a surgery for the particular lymphoid organ and the child was much better later. Let us see which lymphoid organ is situated behind the nasal cavity which can result in a characteristic facial feature on getting infected and enlarged. Today's topic that is the pharynx will be covered under the following headings. A line of introduction, extent and communications of the pharynx, subdivisions, the internal features of the different subdivisions, the structure of the pharynx where we will discuss about the various coats in the walls of the pharynx, the muscular coat in detail which will be under the two headings constrictors and the structures passing between them and the longitudinal muscle coat. Then we will be talking about the nerve supply, the blood supply, lymphatic drainage, applied anatomy and we will end the topic by summarizing it. Pharynx is a musculomembranous tube which is a common passage for both food and air that is it belongs to both the airway and the food path that is the elementary system and the respiratory system. The length of the pharynx is about 12 to 14 centimeters and the width varies between 1.25 to 3.5 centimeters. The maximum width of 3.5 centimeters is seen at its upper end whereas the minimum width of 1.5 centimeters is at the lower end where it is going to continue as esophagus. So, that is the pharyngoesophageal junction. When we look at the extent and the communications of the pharynx, we can see it extends from the base of the skull that is near the upper end you find the sphenoid and the occipital bone. The part of the sphenoid which is going to form the upper end of the pharynx or the boundary for the pharynx is the body of the sphenoid. And the occipital bone part which is seen here is the basilar portion of the occipital bone. Anteriorly it is deficient, pharynx is deficient, it is going to communicate with various other parts that will be the nasal cavity, the oral cavity and the larynx. So, it is going to be deficient at three different places where it is going to communicate with these structures. Posteriorly it is supported by the upper six cervical vertebrae from the atlas down to the sixth cervical vertebra and the lower part of this is going to continue as the esophagus. So, this is the junction of pharynx with the esophagus at the lower border of the sixth cervical vertebra. This uh, is the vertebra which is present on the posterior aspect, the cervical vertebrae. You can see the arch of the atlas here, the second cervical to sixth cervical vertebra supporting the pharynx posteriorly. 
ebo is the body of the sphenoid with the sphenoidal air sinus and this is the basilar portion of the occipital bone. Anteriorly where it is deficient communicating with the nasal cavity, with the oral cavity and with the larynx through these three openings. So, this region will be the pharynx, down it is continuing as the esophagus. So, as we said the communications what are appreciated are the part of the pharynx which is going to communicate with the nasal cavity that part of the pharynx we are going to now call it as nasopharynx that is the upper end of the pharynx. The part of the pharynx which is going to communicate with the oral cavity this will be called as oropharynx and the lower most portion of the pharynx which is going to communicate with the larynx that we are going to call it as laryngopharynx below laryngopharynx is going to continue as the esophagus whereas the larynx will be continuing as the trachea. These communications are small gaps now in this picture you can appreciate the communications as visualized from the pharynx. So, you are visualizing the posterior aspect of these communications. So, visualizing it from the pharynx. So, you see here is the coane which is the posterior neural apertures or posterior nasal apertures which is going to communicate the nasal cavity with the pharynx which will be here and this is the oropharyngeal isthmus. You can see the soft palate with the uvula here and here is the epiglottis. On either side will be the tonsil in the tonsillar fossa. So, this is the oropharyngeal isthmus communicating the oral cavity with the pharynx behind. Now, lower down here you can see an opening which is present here this is called as the inlet of the larynx it is going to lead on to the larynx. So, pharynx here will be communicating through the inlet with the larynx. Below it is going to communicate with the esophagus or continue with the esophagus. Here we can appreciate the same subdivisions. This blue colored area here which is behind the nasal cavity and above the soft palate is the nasopharynx. It is purely respiratory in function. This green line here respiratory passage. So, nasopharynx here is purely respiratory. It is behind the coane which is going to communicate nasal cavity with the nasopharynx. The same region can be appreciated here. This is the coane communicating nasal cavity with the nasopharynx. It is above the soft palate and at this level is the pharyngeal isthmus separating nasopharynx from the oropharynx below. This region is called as pharyngeal isthmus. So, this is the pharyngeal isthmus here. So, this region nasopharynx is purely respiratory in function. So, we can correlate this with the lining epithelium, it will have what type of epithelium for the respiratory tract? It is going to be ciliated columnar epithelium. So, this will be lined by ciliated columnar epithelium, nasopharynx. Oropharynx is where there is crossing of both the foodway and the airway. So, this green line is the airway here and this red line is the footpath. So, you find there is communication between the two in this region and this is the oropharynx region. So, oropharynx is separated from the nasopharynx at this point that is the pharyngeal isthmus. Oropharynx communicates with the oral cavity at this point that is the oropharyngeal isthmus. Oropharynx communicates with the laryngopharynx at this point, this is the upper border of epiglottis that level. A plane passing through this will separate the oropharynx from the laryngopharynx. Laryngopharynx will be purely a footpath again belonging to the elementary system. Whereas, oropharynx is the one where there is crossing of the two which can be appreciated here crossing of the green and the red lines that is the oropharynx. Laryngopharynx is purely a footpath, nasopharynx is purely an air path. Now, let us look at the individual subdivisions of the pharynx, their boundaries and features. So, this is the upper end of the pharynx. So, this is called as nasopharynx. 
nasopharynx. Nasopharynx has got fixed walls, so it is not mobile. The mucosa is adherent to the underlying tissue which has most of the region it has a bony wall. So, you find the mucosa adherent be making it a fixed uh, wall structure so that it is not mobile in nature, it cannot expand, it is purely in passage for the air. You find this nasopharynx has the following boundaries, it has almost cuboidal in shape, so it has a roof, a posterior wall, a floor, an anterior wall and two lateral walls, one on either side. Since this is a section, you are going to see only one lateral wall here. Now, this is the anterior wall which is deficient. Here will be the opening for the communication with the nasal cavity. So, this region will be called as coane or the posterior nasal aperture through which nasopharynx is communicating with the nasal cavity. So, this is the coane or the posterior nasal aperture. This is the roof and the posterior wall, they are continuous with each other, sloping downwards and backwards. It is formed by the body of the sphenoid if the sphenoidal air sinus, the basilar portion of the occipital bone and the anterior arch of atlas. So, these structures will form the roof and posterior wall sloping downwards and backwards. They are all covered by a mucous membrane which will show certain features. This is the floor which is deficient. This is the floor which is deficient. So, you find this floor which is deficient has communication between the nasopharynx and the oropharynx. So, this is formed by what is called as the pharyngeal isthmus. It is bounded anteriorly by the soft palate on either side by the palatopharyngeal arch which is going downwards here. It will send an expansion back palatopharyngeal muscle which will form a thickened elevation in the mucosa, a mucosal ridge which is called as Passavant's ridge posteriorly. So, this forms a boundary for the pharyngeal isthmus separating the nasopharynx from the oropharynx. So, soft palate, palatopharyngeal fold, Passavant's ridge posteriorly. So, on either side when you trace that separates the nasopharynx from the oropharynx, that is the floor. So, anterior wall and the floor is deficient, roof and posterior wall sloping downwards and backwards. This is the lateral wall. Lateral wall has an opening for the communication with the middle ear or the tympanic cavity. This is the opening of the auditory tube. It is the medial end of the auditory tube or the pharyngeal end of the auditory tube opening into the nasopharynx. So, this will communicate the nasopharynx with the tympanic cavity or the middle ear cavity. So, these are the boundaries of nasopharynx. Let us look at the features in the nasopharynx. The roof and posterior wall which is looping downwards and backwards shows certain features. You find there is a small elevation at the junction of the roof and posterior wall. This elevation is due to aggregation of lymphoid tissue here which will form what is called as nasopharyngeal tonsil. Since it is present in the nasopharynx, it is called as nasopharyngeal tonsil. And this nasopharyngeal tonsil when infected and enlarged, it will be called as adenoids. If it is projecting into the nasopharynx, it will obstruct the airway. So, the person will start breathing through the oral cavity or the mouth. This results in high arched palate, thickening of the tongue, infected surface of the tongue or a coating on the dorsal surface of the tongue, even bad breath, a false smelling breath can take place. All this is due to enlargement of this nasopharyngeal tonsil projecting into the nasopharynx. So, that will be called as adenoids and the facial features which appear, it is called as adenoid faces. 
the surface of the nasopharyngeal tonsil will have a small mucosal diverticulum which will be called as pharyngeal bursa or pouch of lushka pouch of lushka l u s c h k a pouch of lushka it's a mucosal diverticulum present on the surface of the nasopharyngeal tonsil and this diverticulum will be lined by mucosa which will have mucosal glands. So, secretions from this glands are poured into this diverticulum. So, if you look at the surface of the nasopharynx like this, you find this is a diverticulum projecting like this which will have mucosal glands in it. The secretions which are poured here can obstruct the opening resulting in the formation of a cystic swelling. A cystic swelling can result and this is due to infection of the pouch of Lushka. So, that is the nasopharyngeal tonsil with the pouch of Lushka or the pharyngeal bursa on the surface. So, this feature is seen at the junction of the roof and the posterior wall. Already we discussed that there is an opening in the lateral wall which is called as tubal opening. It is the opening of the auditory tube or the pharyngotympanic tube. It is called as pharyngotympanic tube because it connects the pharynx that is the nasopharynx with the tympanic cavity. You find this opening is guarded by an elevation here which is present on the superior and posterior aspect. This elevation is called as tubal elevation. Just behind this tubal elevation is a aggregation of uh, lymphoid tissue which will be called as tubal tonsil that will be present here tubal tonsil. So, you find the opening of the auditory tube, the tubal elevation and the tubal tonsil in relation to the lateral wall. Behind the tubal elevation you will find a small recess, a mucosal recess which is called as pharyngeal recess. It is also called as fossa of Rosenmuller. Fossa of Rosenmuller. This is the pharyngeal recess which is present on the posterior aspect of the tubal opening. The other name is Fossa of Rosenmuller. What is the importance of this pharyngeal recess or fossa of Rosenmuller? You find lateral to this is the carotid sheath and its contents and in this region just next to the pharynx what is present is the internal carotid artery. So, that has to be kept in mind when the fossa is approached. Why do we need to approach the fossa? It will be by mistake because we need to approach this tubal opening when there is a block in the auditory tube, we try to put some air into the auditory tube by putting a metal catheter through the nose, through the inferior meatus of the nose, you put a metal catheter and try to insufflate air into this tube, that is the auditory tube because normally it contains air. If it is blocked then the air gets absorbed tympanic cavity you find there is retraction of the tympanic membrane and the person will complain of pain. So, to relieve these symptoms you need to push in air into the tympanic cavity and the auditory tube. So, how do we approach is through the nasal cavity inferior meatus about 1.25 centimeters behind the posterior end of the inferior concha and slightly below it you will find the tubal opening. So, through a metal catheter you are going to insufflate air here. This tubal elevation will help you to guide the uh, metal catheter into the tubal opening. If you miss the tubal elevation what will happen is you are going to go behind the tubal elevation you will be entering this region and that is the pharyngeal recess. So, if you miss the tubal elevation you are going to go into the pharyngeal recess and if you try to push the metal catheter laterally, what is the most important structure lying lateral to this recess as we have already mentioned that is the yes, internal carotid artery. The metal catheter can puncture the internal carotid artery resulting in severe bleeding. So, if you are not 
going to have a OT, then the person will bleed to death. This is going to be an emergency because a major artery getting perforated in a minor OT. So, we should be very careful while doing air insufflation into the auditory tube. This tubal elevation should guide us and we should not go beyond this into the pharyngeal recess or the fossa of Rosenmuller. So, that is the importance of this tubal elevation and the pharyngeal recess. We see one more feature in relation to this pharyngeal opening. You can see the opening here with the tubal tonsil on the tubal elevation. The lower end of the tubal elevation is going to continue down as a fold of mucous membrane which will have a muzzle of the same name deep to it. This fold is called as salpingopharyngeal fold. It is going towards the pharynx. So, it is called a salpingopharyngeal. Salpingo is because it is coming from the auditory tube. Salpingitis is inflammation of this auditory tube. So, salpingo pharyngeal fold having the same named muzzle deep to it. So, salpingopharyngeus muzzle lies deep to it. You also see one more fold coming down from the opening towards the soft palate. So, it connects the auditory tube to the soft palate. It has a muzzle deep to it. This will be called a salpingopalatine fold, but the muzzle which is present here is levator veli palatini, levator veli palatini, a muzzle of the soft palate. This is the tubal tonsil. Occasionally, you will find remnants of Rathke's pouch in the roof of the nasopharynx. Remnants of Rathke's pouch can be found and this Rathke's pouch remnants, if they are there, they can give rise to the pharyngeal hypophysis because Rathke's pouch will give rise to the development of the adenohypophysis or the anterior pituitary. So, remnants, if they are present here, because Rathke's pouch is a diverticulum from the roof of the pharynx. So, if it is present here, it can give rise to pharyngeal hypophysis. The pharyngeal bursa which we spoke about can have remnants of notochord in it because if there is a adherence of pharyngeal wall with the notochord, then notochordal remnants can be found in the pharyngeal bursa here or pouch of Lushka, then it can result in tumors which can have cartilage in it. So, it can have cartilaginous kind of tumors occurring in the pharyngeal bursa if there are remnants of the notochord present. The next subdivision which we need to have a look at is the oropharynx. Let us look at the boundaries of the oropharynx. This area is the oropharynx. As we have already told, oropharynx is separated from the nasopharynx by the pharyngeal isthmus bounded by soft palate, palatopharyngeal fold, posteriorly the mucosal ridge with the palatopharyngeus muzzle deep to it is the passavant's ridge. So, this forms the boundary for the pharyngeal isthmus separating nasopharynx above from the oropharynx below. Oropharynx is going to communicate anteriorly with the oral cavity. Now, you find one more isthmus here that is the oropharyngeal isthmus. What is the boundary for the oropharyngeal isthmus? It is bounded above by the soft palate on either side by the palatoglossal arch, an arch or mucosal fold connecting palate with the tongue, palatoglossal. You find a muzzle of the same name lying deep to it and inferiorly by the posterior one third of the dorsum of the tongue. So, this forms the oropharyngeal isthmus, oropharynx communicating anteriorly with the oral cavity through oropharyngeal isthmus, communicating superiorly with the nasopharynx through pharyngeal isthmus. Below, it is going to communicate with the laryngopharynx at the level of the tip of the epiglottis, this upper end. At this level, it is going to continue as laryngopharynx. Posteriorly, you find it is supported by the second and third cervical vertebrae with the longest coli muscles and the anterior longitudinal ligaments covered by prevertebral other muscles and the fascia, prevertebral layer of deep cervical fascia. All these are separated from the mucosa and the pharynx by a retropharyngeal space, a space separating these structures from the pharynx 
retropharyngeal space. It is a potential space for infection to spread. That is the importance of this retropharyngeal space. Let us look at the features in the oropharynx. Lateral wall of oropharynx shows a triangular fossa. This will lodge the largest lymphoid organ here that is the palatine tonsil. So, this is called as tonsillar fossa. Tonsillar fossa is triangular in nature. The apex is towards the soft palate. The base is towards the lateral border of posterior one third of the tongue. Anteriorly it is bounded by the palatoglossal fold containing the muscle of the same name palatoglossus. Posteriorly it is bounded by palatopharyngeal fold containing the muscle of the same name palatopharyngeus. This triangular fossa will have the palatine tonsil the surface of which is irregular with lot of pits. One of them is large, it is called as intratonsillar cleft. It is a remnant of the second pouch, intratonsillar cleft. The floor of the tonsillar fossa here will be formed by the superior constrictor and the stylopharyngeus covered by pharyngobacillar fascia. That is the floor of the tonsillar fossa. This is one of the feature present. The other feature present in the oropharynx is the connection or mucosal folds extending between the dorsum of the posterior one third of the tongue and the anterior surface of the epiglottis. They are called as glossoepiglottic folds. You find a median glossoepiglottic fold and two lateral glossoepiglottic folds. When we tell a median glossoepiglottic fold, if you think this is the tongue, this is the posterior one third of the tongue, this is the sulcus terminalis with the foramen cecum, this is the posterior one third of the tongue and here is the epiglottis viewed from above. Okay? You find there is a communication between the dorsum of the tongue posterior one third and the anterior surface of the epiglottis. This fold is called as median glossoepiglottic fold and there is one which is called as on either side lateral glossoepiglottic fold. So, this is lateral fold and this is median fold. Median glossoepiglottic fold and lateral glossoepiglottic folds. In between these two, you will find two depressions taking place which will be called as vallecula. Vallecula is a depression, mucosal depression between the glossoepiglottic folds, the median and the lateral. The lateral glossoepiglottic fold is going to separate the vallecula from another depression which belongs to laryngopharynx that is called as pyriform fossa. So, lateral glossoepiglottic fold is going to separate vallecula from pyriform fossa. So, these are the features seen in the oropharynx. Next, we go on to the laryngopharynx. Laryngopharynx extends from the upper border of epiglottis this is the upper border of epiglottis till the lower border of C6 vertebra and this beyond this is the esophagus. So, it communicates below with the esophagus. It extends from the upper border of the epiglottis which is present here till the C6 vertebra. It is going to communicate anteriorly with the larynx through inlet of the larynx. This is the inlet of the larynx. Inlet of the larynx is bounded anterior superiorly by the upper border of epiglottis on either side by a fold of mucous membrane which is called as epiglottic fold. Posteriorly by a fold of mucous membrane it is called as interarytenoid fold of mucous membrane. So, this will form the boundary for the inlet of the larynx through which the laryngopharynx will be communicating with the larynx. Posteriorly, it is supported by these vertebrae that is C4, C5 and C6 
vertebra C4 to C6 vertebra. Anteriorly below the inlet it is supported by the lamino of the cricoid cartilage, lamino of the cricoid cartilage. Above it is deficient where it communicates with the oropharynx at the level of epiglottis. So, these are the boundaries for the laryngopharynx. This is the inlet of the larynx through which it is going to communicate with the larynx. This is the upper border of epiglottis, areepiglottic fold of mucous membrane, interaretinoid fold of mucous membrane. Below this here will be the lamina of the cricoid cartilage. So, these structures will lie in the anterior wall of the laryngopharynx. On either side you will find a depression, boat shaped depression which is called as pyriform fossa. Now, what do you see here is a boat shaped depression bounded medially by areopiglottic fold laterally by mucous membrane covering lamina of the thyroid cartilage and the thyrohyoid membrane above separated from the vallecula by the lateral glossoepiglottic fold below it is going to lead on to the esophagus. What is the importance of this spiriform fossa is this boat shaped depression is a dependent portion of the pharynx and you find the foot which is ingested is going to go along this spiriform fossa and then enter the esophagus that is the direction. Deep to the mucous membrane in the pyriform fossa region you will find the internal laryngeal nerve and the superior laryngeal vessels. Internal laryngeal nerve which is going to be sensory for the larynx is going to cross the pyriform fossa to reach the larynx. Whenever there is a sharp object which is ingested like a fish bone, it is going to get stuck here in the pyriform fossa thereby injuring the internal laryngeal nerve and the superior laryngeal vessels. If internal laryngeal nerve is injured, the dangerous condition which results is sensory loss above the vocal fold. So, what happens? A person can take in the foot particles instead of entering the pharynx, they can enter the larynx because there is anesthesia in the upper part of the larynx. This can result in aspiration and result in pneumonia or death. So, that is the seriousness of this condition. So, this is the pyriform fossa which will have the internal laryngeal nerve. Because of its relation it becomes very important that is the feature in the laryngopharynx. Now, let us look at the structure of the pharynx. The wall of the pharynx is got four different coats. One is the mucosa, the submucosa, muscular coat and the areolar coat. The mucosa it has a lining epithelium, it can be either ciliated epithelium as seen in the nasopharynx or it can be stratified squamous non keratinized epithelium as seen in the oropharynx and the laryngopharynx. The junction between the two ciliated and the stratified epithelium is at the level of the soft palate just behind the auditory tube it changes. Sometimes you find a strip of epithelium at this junction which is non ciliated columnar epithelium that is the junction between the ciliated and the stratified squamous epithelium. The submucosa has a layer of connective tissue which will form what is called as pharyngobacillar fascia. Pharyngobacillar fascia is going to be thick in the upper end of the pharynx where it is going to close a deficiency in the wall of the pharynx present there which is called as foramen or sinus of morgagni, sinus of morgagni at the upper end of the pharynx. So, this will be above the superior constrictor and this gap is filled by pharyngobacillar fascia and also by thickening of the outer areolar coat buccopharyngeal fascia and this will be pierced here by the auditory tube. The next layer is the muscular coat. It is arranged as two layers, a inner circular and outer longitudinal. Inner circular layer will is formed by the constrictors, superior, middle and inferior constrictors of the pharynx. Whereas, the outer longitudinal has got again three pairs of muscles. 
they are descending down from various structures coming down to the pharynx. The one which comes from the palate is called as palatopharyngeus. The one which comes from the auditory tube is called as salpingopharyngeus and the one which comes from the styloid process is called as stylopharyngeus. The last outermost coat is the areolar coat formed by the buccopharyngeal fascia. This will cover the external aspect of the pharynx and the buccinator. That is why it is called as buccopharyngeal fascia. Mucosa shows this feature that is aggregation of lymphoid tissue which is going to guard the opening of the pharynx both the nasopharynx and the oropharynx. So, you find but both the airway and the foodway through which organisms can enter will be combated by this lymphoid aggregation. This lymphoid aggregation together it is called as Waldeyer's ring. The components of Waldeyer's ring are in the superior aspect of the nasopharynx you find the nasopharyngeal tonsil. On either side near the tubal opening is the tubal tonsil. At the oropharynx you find the palatine tonsil or the tonsil which is the largest and below on the dorsal surface of the tongue you find lymphoid aggregation called as lingual tonsil. All these put together it forms a ring which is called as Waldeyer's ring. It is going to guard the both the respiratory pathway and the elementary pathway or the gastrointestinal pathway together to prevent any infections occurring through this unless they are weakened. These lymphoid organs are well developed in children, but they start undergoing atrophy in older age. Let us look at the muscle coat. The inner one is the constrictors of the pharynx forming the circular muscle coat. We have already told the constrictors are in the form of three superior constrictor, a middle constrictor and a inferior constrictor. When we tell constrictors immediately we know that they have circular muscle fibers. All the fibers will go backwards and get inserted to a midline raphe which runs from the upper end that is from the base occiput where there is a pharyngeal tubercle till downwards till the beginning of the esophagus. So, there is a median fibrous raphe to which all these constrictors will be getting inserted. Now, let us look at the origins of the constrictors. The superior constrictor takes, it, uh, takes its origin from the pterygoid process, the medial pterygoid plate and the pterygoid hamulus. The pterygoid hamulus is connected by means of a raphe to the mandible bone which is called as pterygomandibular raphe. It also takes its origin from the posterior aspect of the inner surface of the mandible just behind the mylohyoid line. It also takes its origin from the side of the tongue near the third molar teeth. So, all these together will give origin to linear origin to superior constrictor. The pterygomandibular raphe here will give origin to the superior constrictor posteriorly whereas, it gives anteriorly it gives origin to the buccinator. Now, the muscle which is part of the muscle which is arising from the pterygoid plate and the pterygoid hamulus is called as pterygopharyngeus. The part which is arising from the pterygomandibular raphe this is called as buccopharyngeus. The part which is arising from the mylohyoid line of the mandible is called as mylopharyngeus and the part which is arising from the tongue posterior part lateral border is called as glossopharyngeus. So, these are the parts of the constrictor that is the superior constrictor of the pharynx. The fibers will run backwards, they are run upwards to the pharyngeal tubercle on the occipital bone and they run downwards till the C6 cervical vertebral level or the lower border of the cricoid cartilage level till there the fibers will be descending down. Next is the middle constrictor. <coughs> The middle constrictor takes its origin from the hyoid bone. It takes its origin from the lower part of the stylohyoid ligament, the lesser cornu of the hyoid bone and the superior surface of the greater cornu of the hyoid bone. The fibers run backwards and then they spread out. They enclose the superior constrictor and get inserted to the pharyngeal tubercle. 
and they run downwards posterior to the superior constrictor reaching up to the lower border of 6 cervical vertebra or the, uh, the cricoid cartilage that is the middle constrictor. The last constrictor which is present is the inferior constrictor. It takes its origin from the thyroid cartilage which is called as thyropharyngeus and from the cricoid cartilage which is called as cricopharyngeus. Thyropharyngeus takes its origin from the oblique line of the thyroid cartilage and the inferior horn of the thyroid cartilage whereas the cricopharyngeus takes its origin from the anterior arch of the cricoid cartilage and also from the tendinous arch overlying the cricothyroid muscle. So, these two together will give origin to cricopharyngeus muscle. The thyropharyngeus muscle is similar to the other constrictors, will have fibers which diverge upwards and downwards getting inserted to the median fibrous raphe, whereas cricopharyngeus fibers run posteriorly going to the opposite side without any interruption. So, when cricopharyngeus contracts, it is going to act like a sphincter whereas the other constrictors will act in bringing about propulsion, the movement of propulsion. So, these are the constrictors of the pharynx. Let us look at the gaps which is present between the constrictors and the various structures passing through them. Above the superior constrictor, you will find a gap which is called a sinus of Morgagni which is filled by buccopharyngeal and pharyngobasilar fascia. It is pierced by the auditory tube which is going towards the nasopharynx and it also pierced by levator veli palatini as it is going towards the soft palate, it passes through the sinus of Morgagni. It also allows for the passage of ascending palatine branch of facial artery and the ascending pharyngeal artery. So, all these will be passing through the sinus of Morgagni filled by pharyngobasilar and buccopharyngeal fascia. So, it is a gap between the base of skull and the superior border of constrictor of pharynx that is the superior constrictor upper border. The junction, the space between the superior and the middle constrictor of pharynx, this space will allow for passage of two structures. One is the muscle which is coming from the styloid bone or styloid process and the nerve associated with it which is going to supply it. The bone, uh, the muscle is the stylopharyngeus which is taking its origin from the medial surface of the base of the styloid process, medial surface of the base of the styloid process. It runs downwards, it is accompanied by the glossopharyngeal nerve which is going to supply it. This glossopharyngeal nerve is the nerve of the third arch and stylopharyngeus has developed from the third arch mesoderm. So, it is going to supply only this muscle. So, it is a cranial nerve supplying only one muscle and that is stylopharyngeus. This two structures will be passing through a gap between the superior and the middle constrictor. The last gap is between the middle and the inferior constrictor. The structures passing will be the internal laryngeal nerve branch of superior laryngeal branch of vagus accompanied by superior laryngeal vessels artery is the branch of superior thyroid artery. Both these structures after passing through the gap between these two muscles that is the middle constrictor and inferior constrictor, they are going to pierce the thyrohyoid membrane to enter into the uh, laryngopharynx, they lie in the pyriform fossa deep to the mucosa, they will cross this and go to the larynx. The superior laryngeal nerve is going to supply the mucosa of the larynx above the occult fold, it is a sensory nerve. The last part is below the constrictors itself, that is the lower border of inferior constrictor, you find two structures entering, one is the recurrent laryngeal nerve accompanied by inferior laryngeal vessels. Inferior laryngeal artery is a branch of inferior thyroid artery, recurrent laryngeal nerve is a branch of vagus nerve. So, both of these will be entering through the gap below the inferior constrictor, they will be entering the pharynx. So, these are the structures passing between the constrictors. Let us look at the longitudinal muscles of the pharynx. We have already mentioned there are three longitudinal muscles. This is the stylopharyngeus from the medial surface of the base of the styloid process accompanied by glossopharyngeal nerve passing through the gap between the superior and the middle constrictor. 
this is the largest muscle here among the longitudinal muscle coat muscles, this is the auditory tube opening, so this is the salpingopharyngeus, this will join with the largest muscle that is the palatopharyngeus. Palatopharyngeus is going to go backwards from the soft palate descending down into the pharynx, it is going to send an expansion to the posterior aspect of the pharynx. This is the junction between the nasopharynx and the oropharynx forming the pharyngeal isthmus, so it forms the passwans ridge, the palatopharyngeus muscle. Palatopharyngeus muscle is going to take its origin from the superior surface of the palatine aponeurosis by means of two fasciculi and in between the two fasciculi is the levator veli palatini muscle. The two fasciculi will join together and descend down into the lateral wall of the pharynx and it will be joined by the salpingopharyngeus muscle. All three longitudinal muscles that is the palatopharyngeus, the salpingopharyngeus and the stylopharyngeus join together to form a sheet which is going to get inserted to the posterior surf border of the lamina of the thyroid cartilage extending from the superior horn to the inferior horn. So, this longitudinal sheet of muscles is getting inserted here that is the posterior border of lamina of thyroid cartilage and they also send expansions backwards on the inner aspect of the constrictor muscles. Let us look at the nerve supply. All these muscles are supplied by the motor no nerve of the pharynx. The motor supply is by the cranial part of accessory nerve which is going to supply the pharynx through a plexus that is the pharyngeal plexus. It is carried by the vagus. The cranial part of accessory is carried by the vagus muscle sorry vagus nerve and this vagus nerve is going to give a branch which will have the accessory nerve fibers to take part in the pharyngeal plexus. So, pharyngeal plexus is going to supply the pharynx and the nerve which is going to supply the pharynx will be the cranial part of accessory through the vagus. All the muscles of the pharynx are supplied by this except for stylopharyngeus. Stylopharyngeus is going to be supplied by yes nerve of the third arch that is glossopharyngeal nerve. So, glossopharyngeal nerve is going to supply stylopharyngeus, the rest of the muscles will receive from nerve supply from the pharyngeal plexus which will have cranial part of accessory supplying them. There are additional motor nerves going to the inferior constrictor, it also receives supposed to receive branches from the recurrent laryngeal nerve and external laryngeal nerve, recurrent laryngeal nerve and external laryngeal nerve can also supply the additional motor nerve supply to the inferior constrictor of the pharynx. Coming to the sensory nerve supply of pharynx, <clears throat> sensory nerve supply of pharynx it is by means of three different nerves to the three subdivisions of the pharynx that is the maxillary nerve branch via the pterygopalatine ganglion, the pharyngeal branch of pterygopalatine ganglion carrying maxillary nerve fibers will supply nasopharynx, the glossopharyngeal nerve is going to supply the oropharynx and internal laryngeal nerve a branch of vagus is going to supply the laryngopharynx. So, that is the sensory nerve supply. Coming to the pharyngeal plexus which we already mentioned is formed by the cranial part of accessory via the vagus. So, pharyngeal branch of vagus carrying cranial part of accessory, a branch coming from the glossopharyngeal nerve, a branch coming from the superior cervical sympathetic ganglion. So, all these branches and occasionally a branch is also given by the internal laryngeal nerve. So, all these branches will form the pharyngeal plexus which will lie on the middle constrictor, it will lie on the buccopharyngeal fascia covering the middle constrictor of the pharynx. So, this is the plexus which is going to supply motor nerve supply to the pharyngeal muscles except for stylopharyngeus and it also supplies the muscles of the soft palate except for tensor veli palatini which will be supplied by the mandibular nerve. So, that is pharyngeal plexus. Now, let us look at the blood supply of the pharynx. Coming to the arterial supply, it is supplied by 
because it is a long muscular tube, it is going to receive branches from various arteries. So, it is supplied by the ascending pharyngeal artery, a branch of external carotid. It is a medial branch and it is the first branch of external carotid, ascending pharyngeal. It is going to receive branches from facial like ascending palatine and pharyngeal, ascending pharyngeal branches of facial artery. It is going to receive branches from the maxillary, the pharyngeal branch, pterygoid branch, palatine branch. All these branches will be supplying the pharynx coming from the maxillary artery and it is also uh, supplied by the lingual artery. The lingual branches coming, dorsal lingual branches coming from the lingual artery. So, that is the arterial supply. Whereas, the venous drainage, it forms a plexus which is drained by the pterygoid venous plexus which is in turn draining into the internal jugular vein. So, that is the venous drainage of the pharynx. Coming to the lymphatic drainage of the pharynx, it is drained by a plexus of lymphatics which is going to drain into the retropharyngeal lymph nodes which are present in the retropharyngeal space and this ultimately will be draining into the deep cervical lymph nodes which will lie along the internal jugular vein. So, this retropharyngeal space will be a potential space for spread of infection and also for lymphadenitis and suppuration. Let us look at the clinical aspects related, few which we have already described. This is the adenoids, that is the enlarged nasopharyngeal tonsil which can result in blockage of the nasal uh, air pathway resulting in mouth breathing giving rise to adenoid phases. Removal of the adenoids is called as adenoidectomy. It can be scooped out by putting a metal catheter through the oral cavity reaching the nasopharynx to scoop out the adenoids or it can be done along with tonsillectomy, adenoidectomy, removal of the adenoids. You also found in this region there can be a cyst being formed due to pharyngeal bursa, inflammation and infection and blockage of the mucosal opening or there can be cartilaginous tumor if there are remnants of the notochord in the pharyngeal bursa or there can be hypophysis cerebri protruding here due to remnants of the Rathke's pouch being present there. So, all these can happen in the roof and posterior wall. In relation to the auditory tube opening, we have already told about the various applied aspects. When we look at the muscles of the pharynx, there is a weak area in the posterior part of the pharynx between the thyropharyngeus and the cricopharyngeus. This weak area where there is not much of muscle fibers crossing, this area is called as area of Killian dehiscence or Killian's area of dehiscence because this becomes a weak spot. If there is an increase in the pressure within the cavity, there can be outpouching of the mucosa from this weak area. Okay. Then when it pouches out this way, then it is called as pulsion diverticulum, pulsion diverticulum. One of the varieties of pulsion diverticulum is Zenker's diverticulum which can take place between the thyropharyngeus and cricopharyngeus which is the weak area which is called as Killian's dehiscence, Killian's dehiscence. This is the weak area between the thyropharyngeus and the cricopharyngeus which is present posteriorly. You find the thyropharyngeus has got propulsive action whereas cricopharyngeus has got a constrictive action. So, if there is in coordination between the two, the mucosa can pouch outwards forming a diverticulum that is called as pulsion diverticulum and one such variety which happens posteriorly that is known as Zenker's diverticulum. Now, let us look at the summary of today's topic. We have seen that pharynx is a musculomembranous tube which is a common passage for the foodway and the airway. There are a lot of lymphoid aggregations present here because this region is prone for infections through the external communications. The aggregations together form what is called as Waldeyer's ring. It has important communications with the various cavities. 
like the nasal cavity, oral cavity, larynx and the tympanic cavity. This region is the one which initiates deglutition, process of deglutition and the infections here can spread to the surrounding facial spaces. That is why there is the importance of the retropharyngeal space which is present behind the pharynx or the parapharyngeal space which is present on either side of the pharynx. A muscular incoordination in the inferior constrictor two parts that is the thyropharyngeus and cricopharyngeus can result in a mucosal diverticulum. This specimen we can see part of the pharynx. What is seen here is a part of the oropharynx and part of the laryngopharynx. You can see the part of the oropharynx which lies here. So, the portion here is the posterior one third of the tongue because this is the junction of anterior two thirds and the posterior one third of the tongue. This is the circumvallate papillae which lies in front of the sulcus terminalis. This posterior one third has got lymphoid aggregation forming the lingual tonsil. It forms the base of the tonsillar fossa which would have extended above like this. You can see the epiglottis lying posterior to the tongue. So, this leaf shaped cartilage is the epiglottis. Now, this epiglottis is connected to the tongue by means of three mucosal folds, one midline that is the median glossoepiglottic fold, then two lateral that is the lateral glossoepiglottic fold. This is the median glossoepiglottic and this is the lateral glossoepiglottic folds. Between the median glossoepiglottic and the lateral glossoepiglottic fold, you will find this depression which is the vallecula. So, this is anterior to the epiglottis. Now, you find this lateral glossoepiglottic fold is going to separate the vallecula from a depression which is present in the laryngopharynx. This boat shaped depression which is present on either side, this depression is called as pyriform fossa. Pyriform means boat shaped. So, pyriform fossa. It is bounded medially by the aryepiglottic fold, laterally by the mucous membrane covering the lamina of the thyroid cartilage and the thyrohyoid membrane. Deep to the mucosa here, you will find the internal laryngeal nerve and superior laryngeal vessels going towards the larynx. Now, this is the inlet of the larynx. Inlet of the larynx is bounded above and in front by the epiglottis on either side by a fold of mucous membrane containing the same named muscle, ari epiglottic fold. Posteriorly is the arytenoid cartilage with interarytenoid fold of mucous membrane. So, this becomes the inlet of larynx and through this you will be entering the larynx. Now, you find this laryngopharynx continuing as a muscular tube below and that will be the esophagus. This is the esophagus. So, this muscular tube is the esophagus. Junction between the laryngopharynx and esophagus is at the level of lower border of the sixth cervical vertebra or the lower border of this cartilage which is present that is the cricoid cartilage. That is the junction between laryngopharynx and the esophagus. This is the wall of the pharynx, inner is the mucosa, then there is buccopharyngeal fascia outer aspect in between is the pharyngobasilar fascia and the muscle coat. You can see the muscle coat which has been cut and seen in the wall. So, this thickness is the wall of the pharynx from inner to outer is mucosa, the submucosa which has the pharyngobasilar fascia, then the muscular coat made up of two layers constrictors and longitudinal muscle coat, outermost is buccopharyngeal fascia. So, that is the feature seen here in the pharynx and you can see the constrictors. This is the inferior constrictor going upwards and backwards. Above the hyoid bone whatever you see here that is the middle constrictor. Superior constrictor is lost because this part of the specimen is not here. This is the middle constrictor because this is the hyoid bone. You can see the bone here this is the hyoid bone and this is the middle constrictor taking its origin from the greater cornu of hyoid bone. This whole region which is extending backwards is the middle sorry inferior constrictor 
a part which is coming from the thyroid cartilage is thyropharyngeus, a part which is coming from the cricoid cartilage is cricopharyngeus. So, that is the inferior constrictor, this is the middle constrictor, above will be the superior constrictor. Now, you can see these two structures lying between the middle and the inferior constrictor, this will be the internal laryngeal nerve and superior laryngeal artery piercing the thyrohyoid membrane lying between the inferior constrictor and the middle constrictor. So, this is internal laryngeal nerve and superior laryngeal artery piercing the thyrohyoid membrane. Below the inferior constrictor, there will be a structure entering the pharynx. This is a nerve which lies in the tracheoesophageal groove, which is going to enter the pharynx and supply the larynx and the inferior constrictor. So, this nerve is going to enter here will be the recurrent laryngeal nerve. This is the recurrent laryngeal nerve, this is the inferior thyroid artery supplying the thyroid, this is the recurrent laryngeal nerve which is in relation to inferior thyroid artery. With this, we come to the end of the topic of the pharynx. Thank you.